This is Van Dance. You're listening to the Profit Report Podcast with Doug Profit. The Civil War is underway. The year is 1861. The city of Louisville is a Union town. The Union flag, the American flag, is flying across the city and on steamboats. But at the very same time, there's also a chance you would hear the theme of the Confederacy here in the Fall City. Despite a visible Union allegiance, the city remains one major contradiction. Described this way by President of Simmons College, Reverend Kevin Cosby, also an historian. It was schizophrenic and ambivalent as it relates to its position. Historian Keith Runyon points out, We made both Union and Confederate uniforms here. We have the main factory in the city. The uniforms were shipped north and they were shipped south. Jim Holmberg of the Filson Historical Society said we were split. We were a Union town with an underlying level of support for the Confederacy. Author and local historian Brian Bush uncovered this bit of history. Reports of Confederate soldiers walking down the streets in uniform, talking to other Union soldiers. It's just weird. (laughs) And Brian Bush is sitting next to me right here as we continue the Profit Report podcast. Hey, Brian, how you doing? Thank you for inviting me today. I know. We uh, we did that interview, and uh, you really gave great perspective to Louisville's really historic position in the Civil War. Why were we such a contradiction? It all states probably before the Civil War, long before that, when Henry Clay, who's probably Kentucky's greatest senator, always thought there was room for compromise. He was supported slavery, although himself he did not own slaves after a while. But Henry Clay was also very much for the Union, and he always thought there was going to be a point where the Southerners always to themselves with the subject of slavery thought there's a loaded gun on the desk and if you threaten us we're going to use that gun but henry clay thought no you don't we can always compromise so kentucky took that lead very much so and so did louisville citizens taking that lead where yes we belong to the union but we also support slavery. I want to list, let our listeners know that I'm doing this in a, two parts here today. You're going to hear Brian Bush first, and then I'll also talk to Chris Wrights, who was on the, the mayor's recent committee to review public art in our community. Uh, and as you know, two statues with ties to Confederacy are going to be moved by the mayor. I thought this would be a good time to let us dive into what R- Louisville's real history was at the time. And Brian has written books about it. Uh, what's the latest book, your title? Uh, the latest book I have is Favorite Sons of Civil war kentucky and you and i also toured uh the confederate resting place at cave hill cemetery that's correct um and we you and i talked before they moved the confederate statue uh, at L to brandenburg kentucky yes so once again it seems like louisville is fighting the civil war in a way it did back when the civil war was underway we were a split city yes very much so yeah it's almost sometimes you think it's uh, split in half with this city some support the monument some supported the removal of the monument and that fight is still going on. I think the the Civil War never really ended in Louisville. It just kept on going. Well, as you pointed out to me in your history, um, this city embraced the Civil War after it was over. Embraced the Confederacy, I'm sorry, after it was over. I mean, the war was lost, but then all our leaders became confederates oh very much so i mean just a, a typical example confederate general sam boulevard buckner he ends up being governor of the state of kentucky after the civil war almost every single one of your legislatures um senators representatives a lot of them were ex-confederates and they became known as the bourbon democrats and they ruled this state for quite a long time what was louisville like in during the war i mean as a kid growing up here i was always told we were a neutral state uh, in the city seems now that I learn more about the city I grew up in Louisville it, it was just strange well, why was this city no, it wasn't neutral at all no it wasn't um To give you the statistics on some of the numbers, the state of Kentucky recruited about 110,000 Union soldiers and about mm, 30 to 40,000 Confederate soldiers were recruited from the state. Uh, Louisville also had some famous Union commanders that came from the city. Uh, uh, Lavelle Rousseau was probably one of the most famous ones. Um, And what the dichotomy, I think, because of Louisville, it shared both things. You had, like, for example, Louisville was the largest manufacturer of pipes uh, under Dennis Long in the United States. Uh, We were cotton manufacturers. We had mills in this town. We were on the cusp of becoming a major industrial city. But then on the other half, we also 
for example, the population of Louisville in 1860 was 69,000. But of that, about 4,900 were slaves. And even to throw it even weirder in the mix, we also had a free black population, a very small one in Louisville. But there were also some very wealthy uh, black gentlemen. One of them was uh, William Sprawling, if I'm mistaking his name. Forgive me, but I believe that's the way it's pronounced, is Sprawling. And he was a barber in Louisville and saved off enough money where he had almost $30,000 worth of property in Louisville. And, and they were called the Free Black Society. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and they, they lived in the city. Yes. Um, and they, they were they were unencumbered by slavery. How did that happen at the time when the, this war was being fought from one of the aspects of slavery? Well, they always had to keep their papers on them at all times, believe me, because there were others that would, you know, knock them over the head and, and try to sell them back down south. That There's another weird economy in Louisville is where, yes, slavery was phasing out in Louisville, but we were becoming a liquidation center to sell these slaves down south. And there's a couple of historical markers, uh, one right across from the Second Street Bridge where the old Galt Hout was. And I think that was very ironic that here almost all your union generals of the western theater met in louisville for, for conferences including like general grant himself at the galt house all they had to do is open up the shades and look across the street and they could see slave pens something they were fighting against in 1863 so ulysses s grant the one of the lead characters in the whole civil war who helped win it for the union could have looked out the window and seen slaves uh, slave pens they were pens sell, uh, keeping slaves in them that's correct selling that's what that marker says down there yes mm-hmm. the scenes we describe with louisville would, would would that have been accurate you would have seen uh people in union un- un- uniforms and then the confederacy recruiting there maybe along main street in early in the war yes very much so when uh, supposedly quote unquote uh kentucky was neutral um You had recruiting agents on 8th Street um, saying, you know, come join the Union. And then on the other side of the street, you had somebody saying, come join the Confederacy. And because of the neutrality, uh, the Union soldiers were sent to the Indiana side, and the Confederate soldiers were sent down the river, down to New Orleans or Tennessee. So they couldn't stay there. But once the war neutrality was finally broken in September of 1861, and the war started progressing... um, we had a lot of Confederate prisoners of war here. One was on Green Street, I believe. Uh, it's changed its now name. Now it's Liberty. But at that time, that was a prisoner of war camp. And there were up to a couple thousand prisoners of war here in Louisville as they're being transported to other prisoner of war camps farther up north. So, yeah, we, it would be very typical. To, you could see Union soldiers escorting Confederates prisoners of war down the streets of Louisville. Where was Abraham Lincoln's influence in, in Louisville, in Kentucky, his home state where he was born, and of course in this city where he used to come and visit Joshua Speed and the Speed family down at Farmington? Where was his influence in the city? How did Louisville get to be the way it was? Well, you got to turn back to the 1860 election and look at the numbers to see how Lincoln was viewed. You had a big fragmentation in our political parties in 1860. You had Abraham Lincoln for the newly formed Republican Party. Uh, you also also had the Southern Democrats under John C. Breckinridge, another Kentuckian. You also had Stephen Douglas under the Democratic Party, and then you had John Bell of the Constitutional Unionists. And when the numbers start shaking out from the election, Lincoln won less than 1% of the vote. Most of the votes went to either Stephen Douglas or John Bell. And what here we go. John Bell, what he stood for was the Union, support the Union, but let slavery be. So... The Civil War ends, the Union wins. What was it about Louisville that suddenly its key positions were being filled by people who had been loyal to the Confederacy or even had fought in in the hierarchy of it? That's where you have to start looking as the war progresses, 62, 63, 64. You had almost soldiers from every part of the state, but a lot from Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, were all filtering in here into Louisville. And then they would board the train on the Louisville Nashville Railroad and they go to Nashville. And once in Nashville, they would spread out across the south. Well, you know, like, for example, in 1862, during the Confederate invasion of Kentucky, we had almost 100,000 Union troops in the city. And these are young men. you got to keep in mind the average age was, you know, about 18, 19 years old in the Army. And these guys were routing up. There was actually, like, reports that I think it was the Mozart Hall where there was a famous vaudeville scene where the even villain was taking the woman and shots broke out because of the Union soldiers thought <laughs> they didn't realize it was a play and they were trying I, to support against the 
a bad oh guy. Gosh. So, I mean, uh, you had young soldiers drinking. And of course, in the Union eyes up north, because of Kentucky being neutral, they always had that suspicious feeling. Well, you know, those Louisvillians, they just support the war because they were forced to. I see. So they were you know, tearing down fence rails for campfires and everything else. So by the time you get to the end of the war, the Louisvillians were sick and tired of Union soldiers being their city. They're about ready to say, okay, you can go now. Other historians have told me, and you have in the past, that it was really the way they were treated. People, the residents were treated by the Union that, yes. that when they got out of town, they felt sympathy for the Confederacy and adopted it. From That was one of the reasons. Is that accurate? Yes, we had, uh, we had what were called some of them we call the military governors uh one of them was uh confederate or excuse me union general stephen gano burbridge which led a terrible campaign in 1860 late 63 64 uh one of his famous orders was order 69 which said for every union soldier or union sympathizer killed by a quote unquote confederate guerrilla he would select four confederate guerrillas from the louisville prisoner war camps here and execute them on that spot they were retaliatory executions these guys that he selected it had nothing to do with the original crimes. Plus, he got in the great hog swindle of 1864 here in Louisville because you got to keep in mind, Louisville was second only to Cincinnati in the most pork producing. And how do you feed an army? Salted pork. And Stephen Gannel Burbridge, along with some of his other cronies, got in this scheme where they were saying, OK, we know you got hogs. You better sell them to me because if not, you're going to sell them to the Confederates or maybe the Indiana. So he had his agents buying the hogs three to four cents under market price, but selling them back to the union government at full union price. Fascinating. So you can see the kickback they made over. This is that time money, a million dollars in profit by that time. Let's talk about the media newspapers. They were it and Mm -hmm. powerful. Very powerful. Louisville's media was controlled by Confederates. No, that we have. Some, here we go with the dichotomy of newspapers. Uh, you had the Louisville Courier and you had the Louisville Journal. Now, this is where the controversy comes with George Prentice on the statue that we're going on right now. The one in front of the library. Yes, the one in front of the library. George Prentice was chief editor of the Louisville Journal newspaper, and the Louisville Journal was very much pro-union. The gentleman that ran the other newspaper, the Louisville Courier, was Walter Haldeman, and Walter Haldeman was very pro-Confederate. And they used to have battles with each other. Of course, at that time. Both newspapers were actually located across the street from each other. They used to have a little bid saying who was going to win the war. Well, once neutrality was broken, the unions came into the city. And they were looking for Walter Haldeman. So Walter Haldeman had to beat it and go across all the way down in Mississippi and spend out the war because they were going to try him for treason. And according to legend, they took his printing presses and threw him in the Ohio River. But the Binghams for years tried to shake the legacy of the Courier-Journal also being in the hands of a Confederate leader at one time. Wasn't that correct? Wasn't the... Uh... Henry Water. Yes. Uh, Henry Watterson, um, at a very young age, he did. He was a member of the uh, Confederate Army. Um, and according to, to Henry Watterson himself, uh, he was actually, he said he was even at the Confederacy, ran a rebel newspaper for a little while in Tennessee, then that was taken over. Then he went back to the Confederate Army, then quit, came back to Louisville and started running the newspaper again. Um, of course, he was the most famous, most famous editor, and yes. the Watterson Expressway is named after him. Oh, yes, very much so. So... Based on on what our listeners have heard so far, and of course what I found out a few years ago too, should any of us be surprised that statues related to the Confederacy are erected in this town? And no surprise at all. Um, And uh, pretty much across the state too. Um, Overwhelmingly, you have more Confederate memorials than you do Union memorials. And just because more so outside of outside of Louisville, yeah, even outside of Louisville. And you got to look at again. It goes back to the way Kentucky was treated and Louisville during the Civil War. They just saw that basically the Union Army was an invading force and treated the Louisville citizens like they were traitors and they weren't. Many of them were pro-Unionists. But because of the ill treatment, they start changing. And like it goes back to what we were saying after the Civil War, they said, that's it. Well, what I like about your writings and and the way you have presented it, and of course, it's unlike (laughs) what we grew up hearing about history, is that you're able to show the hypocrisy with the reality and the dichotomy of what was reality. And that is this contradiction that we lived in in 
Louisville. So it's unlike it's unlike in any other city that I've seen or researched. And I've lived in Charleston, South Carolina, of course, where the Civil War started for a little bit. And I've visited. Mm-hmm. I've seen how Richmond, Virginia is struggling with it. But in Louisville, we seem to look at this in a very different manner. Yes, we do. Um, and for the longest time, you know, these monuments stood like, for example, the Cherokee Triangle with John B. Castleman statue. That was always a revered mark. That was like a landmark. That's what made Cherokee Triangle Cherokee Triangle and John B. Castleman was seen the man on the horse the man on the horse um, because of all the great contributions he made to the city but overlooking some of the other stuff where he served in the Confederacy and that was just like okay he served in the Confederacy but now that that perspective is now starting to change right and I, I think you and I and other historians Tom Owen and I, I'm not a historian I should clarify that but I'm in agreement with you in that history should not be hidden if they want to move these statues they need to be out in a public place. And that, of course, I think is what you believe from what we talked about in our early conversations about the statue at UofL. Yes, I think the statue shouldn't have been moved. I think that could have been a sparking point for discussion on the campus. They could have had more signage around the monument itself saying, why was this monument erected? What were the thinking of people who erected that monument in 1895? And that could have sparked more discussion and debate about overall what was Louisville like in the reconstruction period. There were attempts around that statue to put boss reliefs, as they call them, or uh, markers Mm-hmm. Uh, balancing the history. Yes. I think they had exist. They existed there in a smaller fashion, obviously, than the monument. Yes. And I, and I think um, Dr. Blaine Hudson, who was at U of L that passed away, he was a, a fantastic historian. Uh, I learned a lot from him. Um, he was leaning towards that himself. He was wanting to put markers all along that area to discuss the Civil War in that area. Uh, He was wanting to bring in trees from Gettysburg to plant those on that site and make it basically a park to talk about the Civil War. That's an interesting idea. I didn't know about the trees from Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. A lot of cities... Of course, Louisville tried to remain neutral and I guess succeeded during that war. Many southern cities were destroyed and burned. Uh, Louisville escaped that kind of disaster. How how did it escape it? Was it because of the large number of uh, Union troops here? That and the forts that we had in this area. Um, they really went into the major mode in 1864 and built about 11 forts in this city. But uh, that was the major reason was we had Union troops here in 1861 and 1862. Then when Confederate General John Hunt Morgan was doing his raids in 61, 62, and 63, especially his great raid of 1863, he knew not to take Louisville. He knew that city was just too well fortified to take it. So that's why he went to Brandenburg and attacked Brandenburg and crossed the river into Indiana during his raid and not us. Why do you think there is still so much interest in in a uh, war that was lost, it was caused called the Lost Cause, mm-hmm. um, and yet it it's still you know they say in this country we're, we're actually still fighting it. Yes, um, I think you have that rose colored glasses that we're looking through it, and a lot of sparks this, and I think some historians will agree with that. Gone with the wind kind of sparked all this and re- resurrected all this with looking at the genteel society and the ladies in their ball gowns, kind of like what. My old Kentucky home does. They kind of fan that a little bit where, you know, the men are in their beautiful outfits and the ladies are in their gowns and, and, you know, the slaves are happy on their estates and just all that. And then, you know, with the Song of the South that came out, that famous movie kind of perpetuated all those myths that were going on. And now his as history have has uh, people are relooking at history you're mm-hmm. you're you're busting those myths as we now know the the whole, my old kentucky home held slaves Yes. Oh, very much so. There's actually a small plot on the golf field. It's where the slaves are still buried. Uh, There's no names on them. They're just little field stones, but they're still there on the golf field. And most of their uh, the houses that kept the slaves were torn down when it started becoming a tourist site. Um, Where on the reverse hand in Tennessee with Andrew Jackson's home, they were actually restored those slave cabins and actually inviting people to come back and see what what reality it really was being a slave. What an odd town we must have been. That fact that we were making the uniforms for both and then shipping them north and south. How odd is that? I guess 
Somebody oh, yeah. had to do it. <laughs> well, yeah. Basically, one thing about Louisville, we like money. <laughs> we were going to trade with, you know, we had brothers and sisters down south, but we also had brothers and sisters in the north. You got to keep in mind that Kentucky at one time was part of Virginia, and then we became our own state. Uh, so we had that southern influence right there, but we also had a very heavy influence of German and Irish uh, that made up the city of this, you know, like 69,000 people. A big portion of that half I was almost immigrant. Uh, so you've got that another whole element to that that's going on in Louisville. And, of course, that's where Prentice gets in some of the controversy that went on with the Bloody Monday riots. But right. The, the, he incited the Bloody Monday riots because of his Yes, in the articles. newspapers. Yes, yeah, racist articles. Uh, you had a – this is before the Civil War. You had a – a party called the American Know Nothing Party or the American Party, which basically it was kind of funny. You'd go up to one of their members and say, can you tell me about the what you stand for in your party? And they say, well, I don't know nothing. So they call them the Know Nothings. But um, yeah, um, they were basically anti-Catholic anti-immigrant. Um, and George Prince has kind of fanned those flames also. You know, it was an eye-opener for me to learn about John Castleman in that, yeah, yeah, he had a hand in founding the parks, but he had a hand in severely segregating them and mm-hmm. kept blacks to their own parks. Yes. Uh, and then they were trying to herald him as a creator of the park system, yet he was keeping African Americans out of the parks. And there's, there's a great book out written by another historian mm-hmm. about his life and that. And so when you dive down in it, don't you, do you find that it's a bit hypocritical that he's there anchoring uh the parks system uh, when when he he didn't make it open for everyone that's true and this is the war this is you know he he on his own monument. I mean, you got to keep in mind that the monument to himself was built while he was still alive and he had a heavy influence over it. And he was standing, he was the founder of the park system. Um, well, I wrote a book about three years ago called Union Colonel Andrew Cowan. Andrew Cowan was one of the heroes of Gettysburg. He was actually there during Pickett's Charge, protecting what was known as the Cops of Trees. Uh, after the Civil War, he was originally from Newark, but came to Louisville because he heard about what a great industrial city was coming, became multimillionaire in the tannery and leather business and he was actually a forerunner where he started making leather seats for the new automobile uh in in louisville and um he used his money towards philanthropy he is actually one of the first ones that came up with the louisville park system he wrote a paper and presented to the salgamundi club i believe it's pronounced and the commercial club and started saying we need a park so the lesser wealthy people in louisville can come out from the heavy polluted air of the city and go out to the country and enjoy free parks and this is where he came up that and then that's where some other guys started coming on the train and all these wealthy businessmen started saying okay we're going to help with the park system so yeah cowan is actually the founder of the park system he castleman is just a member of the helping put the parks together <laughs> and he managed to get his own monument and statue built and, yes and but, installed and, when he was alive <laughs> and that's true and Good cowan gosh. doesn't have anything to him <laughs> i'm learning more and more that's fascinating Louisville, of course, not most cities weren't perfect in civil rights. Our city wasn't, but we were we were turning that corner a lot earlier than uh, the '60s. And and part of that one key figure was Charles Farnsley, the mayor. Yes, but he sympathized with the Confederacy, and yet he was the man who integrated U of L, mm-hmm. the first to integrate Louisville to lead that to try to push for early uh, desegregation of our schools. And he was he was quite a civil rights pioneer in our city and a beloved mayor. Yet he was thick in support of the Confederacy. Yeah, I think there's a famous picture of him with a, a gun standing in front of the Confederate monument in U of L. So, uh, yeah, I mean, um, I don't know a lot about him, but yeah, I mean, Louisville was very much progressive. There was, I wrote about this on my book on Cave Hill Cemetery in the Civil War on a Supreme Court justice for the state of Kentucky that after the Civil War, he actually heard a case about a black woman that was one on, on one of our trolleys here. This is like literally almost after the Civil War. And he said that she had to write the right on that omnibus with white citizens so yeah we were very much it, it, that goes and went again where our city is so schizophrenic i mean we were we progressive in some points but in other points we're looking back to the the good old days of the south were you uh, when you wrap your mind around history because you've you have written about both sides the union and the confederacy and you've looked at the uh, civil rights as you said and and the characters and the people who were at cave hill mm-hmm. uh, what's the one thing i and i always hate to put people on the spot when I say, <laughs> the one thing that's well, is there one thing that blows you away that just to this day with all the research you've done that you were just fascinated by that era 
of that era. Um, I think what fascinates me is I don't think Louisvillians really realized how important this city was in the grand prospect of everything. Um, like I mentioned very earlier, like Dennis Long, he had one of the largest pipe companies in the United States. We were the 10th largest city in the United States and, um, before the Civil War. And we had gas lights in this city. We had running water in this city with the Louisville Waterworks, the tower, which is still around today. And that was rare at the time? That was very rare to have running water in your houses. Uh, and even gas lights. I think we were fifth city in the United States west of the Allegheny Mountains that had gas lights. That sort of began the great quality of life that, you know, we always say is, is really sort of a great town to live in. Oh, yes. I mean, great water and and uh, great manufacturing. I mean, um, I just completed a book that should be published by next year on the Gilded Age in Louisville. You would be amazed at how many in- industries that we had in the city that was number one in the country. Like we were number one in the United States for hydraulic cement. We were number one for cotton uh, and denim in the state uh, and out throughout the country. Uh, we were number one through... Um, uh, manufacturing of different products. Uh, and I think the book will realize that, you know, we were like, for example, plows, BF Avery and company here in Louisville, they were the largest manufacturer of plows in the world. Just think about that for a minute. And this is this is an agricultural country they were coming about. This is fascinating. I, I love the fact that, you know, so many people today, uh, they're fighting over this. But, you know, you, you, you talk in a way where it's all facts. And I like how you look at both sides of this and give mm-hmm. us a real just adjust the facts man version of our history which is what i wanted to do with this podcast uh as we sort of wrap this up tell me about the books you have out there what have you researched and what's out there in case our listeners are interested in, in learning more about brian bush and your writings well i have about 13 books out oh, okay. there so you have well, you plenty have to, to choose from tell so. me the ones you're most proud of <laughs> um maybe the top i four. think if you want to get a sense of what louisville was like um because cave hill cemetery it literally is a walk through history um almost all your important louisvillians are buried in cave hill cemetery Cemetery. And my book on Cave Hill Cemetery in the Civil War will give you a nice introduction of what Cave Hill was like before the Civil War, during the Civil War, and then some of the famous Union and Confederate folks that are buried there and some of the civilians that are buried there. I think one of the most fascinating stories I talk about in the book is Elizabeth Thames. Her mommy and one was just restored about th- three or four years ago. But Elizabeth Thames, uh, uh, Rachel um, Platt, she loved this story I told her with Terry Miners, is that she, this goes to show you how important Louisville was she owned a mansion with her husband George Thames in Calhoun, Georgia. And during the Civil War in 1864, Union General William Tecumseh Sherman, who was actually here in Louisville in 1861 as a military district commander, very did early he meet on, with Grant? Uh, yes, he did have a meeting here with Grant at the the Galt House, uh, I believe 1863, right around there. And uh, old Billy Sherman actually came to the city several times. Um, he even came to the city after the Civil War uh, for some of the reunions. But yeah, Elizabeth Thames. Uh, um, she owned a, a, a plantation in Calhoun, Georgia, and in 1864, when Sherman was coming through, there was a battle of Resaca, Georgia, and it literally erupted almost in her front yard. The Union soldiers were pushing back the Confederates. Uh, the Union soldiers fell back into a dry ravine and waited for the Confederate soldiers to approach. She yelled out, saying to the Confederate soldiers, watch out, boys. The Yankees are waiting for you. The Confederate soldiers backed off. The Union soldiers arrested her, took her to Sherman's headquarters, and Sherman says, I'm going to make you an example that nobody in this town is going to support the Confederates and shipped her here all the way to Louisville, Kentucky. Wow. And she was not used to our winters here. I mean, you got to keep in mind at one time, Louisville used to have the river literally freeze oh, yes. over many times and they would break holes of ships back then. So she was, she got pneumonia. And the Louisville Ladies Relief Association approached her and says, is there anything we can do for you? And she said, yes, bury me with my people. And they literally took her at her word and buried her among the Confederate soldiers at Cave Hill Cemetery. And then, as Paul Harvey would say the rest of the story, her husband, she thought he was dead. He disappeared after the Battle of Bull Run in July of 1861. Um he was not dead. He was actually very much alive, came back after the war, saw his mansion burned to the ground, has no idea what happened to his wife and his children. His children had no idea what happened to their father because they left after their mother was arrested and broken up to different relatives to take care of them after the, uh, the war. Uh, well, I, the Ladies Relief Association, the Confederate Ladies Association, went out and used to decorate the graves on Memorial Day. And it got picked up at the AP Press because one of the 
ladies asked, Albert Cindy Johnston's sister asked, who is Elizabeth Thames? And it got picked up at the AP Press and went across the country. George Thames found out what happened to his wife and his kids out happened to what happened to their wife and they all got reunited. So wow. It's kind of fascinating oh my story. Gosh. And if you go out to Cave Hill Cemetery, and you'll see her tombstone. In, back in the day before Google and texting. Oh, yeah, very much so. <laughs> so her, her, her gravestone is there. It, it's, it's there and it does say bury me with my people. Wow. How can folks reach you, Brian, if they have questions, email or anything you'd like to give out? Uh, I'm on Facebook. You can find me there or you can find me at B-R-Y-A-N under slash B-U-S-H 16 at Yahoo.com. And your books? they can find them where you can find them locally here at carmichael's carries them uh most of the bookstores carry them here you can find them on amazon and and ebay too it's easiest easy for us to jump on these issues today but it's also great to have the perspective of history it makes you think it makes me think twice three times every time i get the real story again you know and, and what louisville was like yeah, history should never be stagnant. It should always be flowing, and you should always question. Always, always question, question what you know. Great, great. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. Our conversation will continue in just a moment with Chris Wrights. Stay with us. forward to 2018, way after the end of the Civil War, obviously, and Louisville's grappling with the issue of what to do with the monuments that were left behind, as Brian Bush was telling us in the first segment of the podcast here. Joining me is Chris Wrights. He's the gallery director at the Height Art Institute at UofL and an assistant professor at the school. And you're also part of the um, the mayor's committee, the Public Art and Monuments Advisory Committee, because uh, the mayor of Louisville is now going to remove two Correct. of the statues, the John B. Castleman statue outside uh, at Cherokee Triangle and then the George Prentice statue at the library. Uh, you were on that committee, Chris, but yes. but you did not tell the mayor. You all, you all opened the, the report by saying, we know there's a lot of issue about the Castleman statue, but uh, we're not going to recommend it be touched. Why was why was that said off the top? So there was actually, there was a great deal of debate um, amongst the committee members. We had, toward the end, it was a, it was a six-month process. We met every month. Uh, and toward the end, we, we debated whether or not we should use the Castleman, which was, we tried to steer conversation away from the Castleman, but you know, every meeting it kept coming back um, to that statue. We thought maybe we should run that statue through our criteria so we can show the mayor this is what happens. This is how these criteria are applied. And um, we, we talked about it during a couple of the meetings and ultimately decided that um, that wasn't the task that we were set with. In fact, the mayor had it was very clear. The mayor's office was very clear that they didn't want us responsible for making decisions about specific monuments. And uh, and so ultimately, uh, the commission decided, well, it's beyond our purview to make specific recommendations. Although you all were tasked to be the authority on the we issue tasked, of what to do with the monument. We were ta- well, there's 400 objects in the collection. Oh, that, okay, so, let's get to that. You all reviewed 400 of them. Well, we didn't. So the idea was we, we rather than look at individual objects, that's what we weren't supposed to do. We were supposed to holistically say, as a community, as a, as a panel of experts from various backgrounds, what should the community standards be for making future determinations about monuments? Because frankly, there's going to be something you know in the public collection, sort of deep in the archive that may come up 20 years from now. So you looked at 400. How many of them did you find tied to Confederacy? Well, we didn't. So we, to be clear, we didn't review every single one. Instead, we holistically thought what kind of criteria in the generic could be applied to them. But in in broad terms, so there were 
only two that had been listed as Confederate monuments. And there's even some debate. One of them had been removed, the Confederate monument. Uh, by U of L. Correct. And the other one, the, the Castleman statue, and again, I'm not an authority on this specific statue, but we did, it came up a lot. Um, it had sort of been Batch. It had been part of a batched group of statues that had been submitted as part as a Confederate statue, and so uh, there was even some debate about whether or not that actually qualified as a Confederate, a Confederate monument. So now um, you've seen the fallout or mm-hmm. the the arguments that uh, you're going to remove two of them. I thought one thing that you got to right away in your findings: monuments are not history. Mm-hmm. That that that's written by your group. I found that fascinating because many people review these statues as removing history. Right. How did you come up with that thinking or conclusion behind it? Yeah. So that's in part it's a response to those claims. Um, it's not a positive or a negative. It's not a refutation because we want to sort of silence that argument. It's that if we're going to think about monuments as history, then you'd have to look at the history of the monument making, not the history that those monuments refer to. Um, monuments are usually built after the fact. They're idealizations of things. They're selections. I mean, not history includes everything. Monuments focus a narrow sort of beam of attention on, on some figures over others. So it's dangerous when we start looking at monuments as the historical record. They are not. Now, they are something really exciting, which is their celebrations of our history. There there are good reasons to have them, but it's not to remove or to change or to move a monument does not erase history. It just changes which history we're focusing on as as a city. Um, And that's what we wanted to make clear. We should focus on bits of our history that we value. We should celebrate our history, but we shouldn't confuse the monument with the things that happened. Did you find, as as we've learned uh, in this discussion today, that uh, our city put up uh, a large number or, or a great amount of monuments after the Civil War that were tied to the Civil War? War that were to honor either fallen soldiers or for what what no. other meaning? No. So really, I mean, our city's in good shape. You know, I, this is a tough commission to be on. This is a tough commission because we've got some great statues. We've got some difficult statues, but this is not Richmond, Virginia. You know, we don't have the same. Kentucky was not part of the Confederacy. We don't have that same legacy. So there's a bit specifically with reference to the to the Civil War, there's more nuance. There are statues that emerge sort of at pressure points. For example, century statues that stand guard in front of um, parks that had become segregated over time. And this, there's a, there's a, a, a really broad national history that involves this kind of monument building. Um, but we don't have the same intensity of Confederate monument making in, in the city as, as others do. Uh, one of your committee members told us in an interview here on our television broadcast that many of the Confederate uh, style statues were put up uh, to remind uh, blacks of mm-hmm. slavery, to remind them of white supremacy. Is, is that the case behind the thinking of some of these uh, monuments? I think that's certainly a a valid argument. We have to be careful or sensitive to that's an interpretation. And it's very difficult for the government institution to be involved in the interpreting of monuments. Monuments on their face just celebrate the life and times of the individual memorialized. What that celebration does, what the effect of it is, included things like, yes, reminding races and classes of their place within a city, uh, segregating or maintaining segregations in these neighborhoods. Um, But when you start going down the path of how are these things activated, how are they used, you could very easily then turn and say, okay, but now the Castleman is being used by a neighborhood association. Um, That's another interpretation of the statue. So we have to be, I think we have to be sensitive to the fact that if we're going to start validating or invalidating statues based on how they're interpreted or used, uh, then we have to be insensitive to all the ways in which they're interpreted and used. And it's easiest perhaps to just say, who is this of? Is this one of the most important figures in Louisville? Is this someone we would celebrate today? If not, perhaps it's not appropriate to maintain it. Of all the other public art you saw in our community or that you reviewed, is there anything else that needs to be moved? So I, we didn't spend, again, these these two were, the, were, in my mind, the most contested. Five years down the road, something might be dug up out of the archive and, you, and I say, oh man, I can't believe we missed that one. Um, so I, I'm not going to say certainty that there isn't anything else, but these were the two that, that struck me as the most problematic. You all wrote Confederate Celebration of the Confederate States of America are not congruent with Louisville's identity as an inclusive city and have no place in the public sphere. That's a that's a that's a strong sentence that would I, if I were the mayor reading that I would say hey well they're they're telling me there what I should do. That didn't give him a lot of options 
with respect, I mean, it gave him two options with respect to the Castleman. That statue, for right or wrong, had been listed as a Confederate monument and was by both the National Registry and by the, um, the there's another organization, oh, so it Southern was, Poverty Law Center. Its Saturn. actual tagline was as a Confederate well, monument from what you all discovered. It, it had been, after the fact, registered as one. And so we would have, if the mayor wanted to keep that statue, I think he would have had to gone through the process of revoking that status um, amongst any organizations that would that would validate or um, or list Confederate statues. The problem is it had been um, part of these lists, um, and also there wasn't a clear sense, I think, uh, amongst community members for why that statue was installed. I mean, I think among uh, some Cherokee Park residents, um, some sort of local residents, it was very clear that this was about the park system. For uh, horse enthusiasts, it was very clear that this was about the Saddlebred Association. Uh, for some, it was about Castleman's status um, in the community. For others, this the fact that his military rank is listed um, indicates that this is a military statue. And so with Without any kind of definitive statement from the city about, no, we're not honoring his military legacy, we're honoring X, Y, and Z, it, it was difficult to maintain, I think. Were there debates on the board where people said, hey, good or bad, monuments should not be moved? They do reflect a segment of history. We, we get in the mis- business of removing history and storing them away, especially with no plan of where they should go. Uh, we're going down a dangerous road. That argument – so we were very – a lot of listening. There was a lot of listening on the commission. And I think that um, one of the things that we attempted to do was synthesize what we were hearing with what our own expertise was, which is a long way of saying there wasn't a moment that you that the public wouldn't have seen where we were sort of laying out, um, I believe this or I believe that. Um, we were really trying to be sensitive to what we were hearing from the community. Um, and so... I don't remember a moment where anyone said that, you know, that explicitly, you know, look, removing monuments is dangerous or um, we debated more in the abstract. Like, is there a slippery slope argument here that we have to be concerned about? Is there? Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things we started doing in that territory then when when you're thinking in these terms are. Okay, who put up the monuments? Was this uh, the city of Louisville took a poll and involved the whole every community or was it six of the guy's friends who put up the money and stuff? In those cases, it's easy to see a monument today and say this has been here forever and it must have been an incredibly important gesture from the city. But the historical record really doesn't reflect that. Very often it's a handful of people who put these things up without a lot of oversight. I mean, it's not always true. Sometimes there are larger panels, but I'm I'm skeptical of that slippery slope argument. It, it, it makes it seem as though there was some kind of consensus around the monument years ago that suddenly changed. There usually wasn't. Usually it was a fairly small group. And uh, now, a, you know, a larger group is upset they're here and the city reflects its citizens. So the mayor has announced he's going to move them, but there's no place to take them. Uh, right. Do you think that was a mistake that there should always be when you when you do this, you say, hey, they're, they're leaving, but they're going to point B? Mm. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, uh, we so I work in public art and generally the, the kind of work that I've done in the past is temporary. Um but there's a difference between the the care and preservation, the, the conservation of an object and the display of an object. And for him to say, look, I want to make a statement about our position on the display of this object shouldn't be contingent on what the other aspects. Do you think these two statues should be in the public somewhere? Hmm. Is there an appropriate place for them? I mean, this is your background I and mean, this is yeah, really what yeah. you studied and uh, right. that's your expertise. Yeah. Well, so it, there's two different questions here. One is, are these interesting artworks? And I think that the Castleman is a more interesting and more important artwork than the Prentice. Statues. I'd agree with you on that. And so that's a that's a mm-hmm. not, that's not based on content or subject. That's just as an object, as an art, right? As a piece exactly. of art. And so that there's a there's a moral obligation to make to preserving artwork there that I think attaches a little bit more to objects that have a greater historical significance or more important creators that sort of thing. So in that regard, there's there isn't a moral kind of obligation, an ethical obligation, sorry, to the to the Castleman. The other thing that I think is important here is I think we need to lower the rhetoric a little bit. Um, there's a sense that it's a kind of good versus evil. You know, was John Breckenridge Castleman a, a heroic, important figure beyond reproach, or was he this sort of evil uh, Confederate terrorist? And in fact, people are complicated. People are largely produced by the systems that they operate within. Uh, Castleman's no different. And our heroes, I think, are the people who are able to get out of those systems and do some really positive good. I don't think Castleman 
did enough of that. And that's maybe his greatest crime. Um, But that doesn't mean that we need to sort of gloat in the fact that history has revealed things or or, or shifted its focus in what uh, uh, important civic leadership looks like. So to long story short, I do think it's worth finding a home for this this object. But I think that it's also important to note that where it is right now says that we idealize and valorize this figure as an essential contributor to Louisville. And I don't know that that's true. Were, were he part of a more nuanced... Well, they say he was one of the creators of the parks, well, and, uh, yep. and we've talked about and uh, of course then he led, his history shows that he led to segregate those parks and kept blacks in their own little park. Although this is, you know, this is if we, not to get too far in the weeds, but this is an interesting debate. Um, in the language of our time, absolutely he was a segregationist, in the sense that uh, when we think of a park being segregated there are separate water fountains, there are separate tennis courts. In his moment, he was advocating to allow black residents access to Cherokee when others were advocating that they actually should be entirely excluded from the park. And so we we do have to be sensitive to how this language changes over time, that in his moment, he wasn't a segregationist. And in our historical moment, he absolutely was. Well, so you've found a bit of history that I had not heard. It's sort of been lost in this, that as it, as as I have read in the books about him that dove into our mm-hmm. parks creations, yes, he created Cherokee and the other parks, but that the uh, African-Americans were to be kept out of the parks. You're saying that's not uh, totally no, true. Well, so there's a bun- there's some courier articles. This is tough. This is not an easy thing to research, but we've spent a lot of time looking. And uh, it looks as though he was adamant in his belief that black Louisvillians should be have access to the same public parks as white Louisvillians. They may not have access to the same facilities in those parks. And so he was, he, he believed in separate but equal, it seems, um, within a Cherokee, within every park. There were other political leaders in the, his moment that were advocating for exclusion from the parks. And he did not believe that. He thought that that black citizens should have access. But in the end, did segregation end up happening? Did yes. he lose that battle? Is he that why that he's been painted with this? After, I believe after his death and certainly after he was uh parks commissioner but under his watch there were separate tennis courts built for example i mean it was look i think that his greatest sin is that he fought uh for the confederacy when kentucky did not that he was part of a really heinous group of confederate soldiers and that even at the end of his life when he wrote his autobiography he dedicated it to the morgan raiders Uh, i mean that's just uh, atrocious Mm -hmm. um the parks stuff is a much more complicated uh issue of statecraft He was a pragmatist and he had some ideals about who had access and not. But, you know, he was a politician and uh, we have to be kind of careful in how we understand the political machinations versus the kind of personal beliefs. He didn't fall on his sword for any great uh, uh, integrated park system, but he did stand up um, when he had the opportunity for black residents to have access. Um, And then he draped his coffin with the Confederate flag. So he a complex character whose sort of original sin far outweighs anything else. Very complicated. George Prentice on the other hand hand doesn't seem to be to be very complicated he was uh, very pro-slavery the, mm. the, wrote the editorials anti-semitic also anti-catholic and uh, was thought to have led to the bloody monday event where more than 20 people lost their lives in louisville the irish catholics yeah. and and they, they thought he he led the the uh the charge the foment that, that led right, to that right. uh, is that the history you found or is there anything that's so going to surprise me about george you know, right, right um i'm i've become i'm less of an expert on prentice because i you know it's we, we, as the, the further away we get from the Castleman Bay that kept coming up, the, the less I know. But um, I think the only nuance that you might be missing is I think that there is some debate in the historical record about to what extent he led to those riots and to what extent this was part of the kind of um, – the and I'm not apologizing for these figures. I'm I'm, I'm merely as a historian trying to uh, situate them within a larger kind of cultural um, system. His writing is horrible. I mean, you know, it's a lot of the his his beliefs about immigration about you know this is it's surprising that we have the statue at all. I think. And, and, and where it's located outside yeah, the main yeah. library. Um, the one issue of trying to balance history, this mm-hmm. uh, this had come up in years years ago uh, when the Confederate statue was getting ready to be moved from the UofL campus. Um, I talked to Tom Owen and others, and, and some have suggested that you balance the, the history of it with the counterside. And in your report, you all say you should do that in very rare cases. 
why why rare cases why not balance that statue with uh something that puts the perspective right. of say of of castleman right so that was a really contentious and this is again public debates that was a really contentious uh, uh clause in fact a number of the committee members didn't want any opportunity for that they they said i don't want it even in rare situations not because all the statues need to be moved but because the city should just have the statues that we you know, should memorialize those figures who we cherish and appreciate without reservation rather than have some with a kind of asterisk. The other problem is that very often those balancing acts don't really work. I mean, a, a 45 foot tall uh, marble monument is, is very hard to balance with any kind of didactic information. What do you, you know? How do you unless you build a hundred foot tall statue next to it? And it's just not practical. Yeah. I mean, I think, look, I this would have been an easier problem if Louisville had a lot more more monuments if if it was a whole uh, uh, pantheon of all of the figures who were involved in the park system and Castleman were just one of them I, I think we'd have less trouble but that's not the the case in Louisville so simply to add some balancing material implies that otherwise you know all the important figures are represented they're not we're missing a lot of people and so that's really where the issue is if we're going to only highlight a handful of Louisvillians it better be some some pretty impressive Louisvillians, not contested, conflicted figures. That's a good point. Well, let's think of the possibilities then, um, because of your background in mm-hmm. art. What could replace Castleman? Okay, oh boy. you've got this wonderful location, which is now basically a traffic circle, but uh, at the anchoring of the Cherokee Triangle, mm-hmm. uh, and it was originally the, okay, the original statue was there to to glorify the the creation of the park. So yeah. if we keep that same meaning, think of the possibilities of what you could do there. Uh, do you have any ideas? Of something well, that could. I, I liked your idea of all the people who were involved. Right. In it. That would have been pretty cool, but we're, we're, it'll probably be something different. It probably will. I mean, that was. So that was one of the things that I had mentioned. Uh, you know, if there were a way to be more inclusive in how we think about who was involved in the park system, um, I've heard a couple of times that the idea floated that in London there's a thing called the Fourth Plinth, which is a, an empty pedestal with rotating public art that kind of appears at regular intervals. Um, that would be neat. I. When I worked at Public Art Fund, we had moved to a temporary model only. The idea being that you can do really interesting, risky stuff as long as it's temporary. Uh, it's when you start trying to make permanent statues that you have to make everyone happy and then you sort of have uninteresting statues. So um, I'd be all for a rotating, uh, changing kind of public statuary. Um, but, you know, I you think- would you would have to have um, pretty large statues there, would you? I mean, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. But we, I mean, but public art usually is yeah. monumental. And- so, so I guess we have that somewhere around here. I mean, that you could rotate them out. Maybe there's, maybe we've got, uh, I wonder if we have a warehouse of a public art. Oh, well, we have. So you. we do have stuff in our collection, but I'm even thinking like commissioning new work. You have an artist, I see. you know, why not have an artist come in and, uh, and kind of interpret our park system for a year and then, then, you know, rotate that out, uh, in a way that, you know, what some of our viewers suggested, which I thought was interesting. Oh, yeah. I, I, I don't know you would, how you would have to, how you would do it but um i guess they were going because there was a horse theme mm, there yeah. uh some of the triple crown winners oh sure so there are 13 of them so this is an interesting point so the the cherokee park um it's a horse park right i mean there's a lot of stuff there i was a, an artist in town gala irwin who's a, a horse you're right was it's history it is his there's history takes a thing. lot of stuff there that allows you mean you don't horseback ride in the park anymore but you you could that would be an interesting uh attack to kind of remind us of the equestrian uh, relationship between our parks and the city well because you had you had the um the the gallapalooza as they call mm-hmm. the statues you know of the horses that were made of porcelain right right that were brightly colored in that if you do sort of a bronze view. I don't know where those those statues would go after they. Yeah. I mean, who, who? I mean, if you're going to make it rotating, right? <laughs> you've got 13 of them. Right. You're just right, going to put right, right. one there. Yeah. Well, I think then you you believe the struggle over removing the statues is really over. You said Louisville's in good shape. Well, I only mean in relationship to other cities. I don't think that. Um, I'm happy about this. I'm happy that we're having this conversation. I mean, what better effect can public art have than than in provoking its citizens to talk about the history of Louisville? I mean, so many amateur historians came forward with information about Castleman. It was uh, amazing. I mean, was it um, accurate? Some of it was accurate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There, and some of it was opinion, um, but terrific. I mean, to have so many people spending time thinking about uh, these important figures in Louisville's history. That's great. Um, I think 
think that the statue, in a sense, did more in the last two or three years uh, to provoke dialogue about Louisville's history than it had in the you know fifty preceding. And so now I you know I should say that it's been vandalized every decade. I mean there has been an ongoing argument, but I'd be happy to see more conversation. I I, I don't think the mayor wants this kind of conversation. But one of the things that we mentioned is turning a focus to uh, historic sites, historic homes, historic bridges, things that can be reactivated with new information. You can designate a city square a historic monument, and when new information is revealed 10 years later, you can change the plaque, you can change the signage, and that really informs and changes the way we interact with it. That's a lovely thought, I think, that you might walk through the city of Louisville encountering historic material that changes uh, every every generation or so. Well, as, as we wrap this up, can you tell me the reaction mm. you got to your work when the report came out and then the mayor's decision? Did you get pushback? Were you suddenly uh, getting uh, negative comments from people who said you were on that committee that right. removed those statues or or led to that? Or, or what, what kind of feedback have you been getting? So not my, I mean, I'm not inviting it now, but I have, <laughs> but, but um, no, no, I mean, I haven't, I haven't really received much feedback. Um, I think, so a couple of things happened. The line about the fact that we shouldn't have any Confederate statuary, there were, there was some pushback there from the community that thought that was directed at Castleman. Mm-hmm. And really, I mean, that's a clarification line. That's, we better not have any Confederate statues. So, you know, one way or another, the mayor needs to make sure that we don't. That could have gone two directions. Again, that could have been the removal of Castleman. It could have been redesignating it and ensuring that it's not. But that was an area that I got at least some pushback that thought that was sort of an undercover dig at Castleman. And it wasn't. It was actually referring to the original Confederate monument and how um, this was an appropriate gesture. But since the removal, um, you know, maybe the maybe those that know me that uh, are in favor of keeping it just haven't said anything to me. I don't. But uh, no, I haven't heard much. Well, it's interesting your review that uh, you found the number of statues or pub pieces of public art that you did mm-hmm. and uh, where they stand. And, and I'm frankly surprised because of what we've learned about the history of Louisville after the Civil War, mm-hmm. how it embraced race the confederacy after the civil war that we don't have more statues well you know there has to be money honestly a lot of these statues that went up came from third party organizations like the daughters of the confederacy that came and said we'll fund this for you if you put it up the history of louisville and the history of monument making are different and that's true in every city the history of monument making looks like someone who wanted a monument paid for it uh, very often and so if that doesn't happen you don't end up with uh, the statuary well, Chris, thanks for your thoughts. How can people reach you if they want to send you an email or um, learn more about your work? Well, they can go to my website. Uh, the University of Louisville maintains a faculty website and all my contact information is there. All right. Again, Chris Wrights is the gallery director at the Height Art Institute at UofL and assistant professor at the school. And my guests, as we've been talking about Louisville's twisted history and the uh, Civil War, historian Brian Bush and Chris Wrights. Thank you for uh, listening to this edition of the Profit Report podcast. You can always reach me by my email. It's D profit that's d-p-r-o-f-f-i-t-t at whas11.com and this has been a presentation of whas11 media 